We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our IGF 2021 session on learning resilience in the face of the pandemic. Today's session is an interesting one, um, and I, so I thank you for joining us. Uh, I know we are competing with quite a number of sessions, including a main session, and so for you to be here, uh, we really, really appreciate it. Um, so I was saying today is an interesting session because we will look at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on capacity building and learning. Needless to say, um, the pandemic has affected all our lives, including those of us who are in the technical community, who are working to provide network access, uh, working to provide training and capacity building opportunities for people who are in rural or underserved communities. Now, if you notice in the session title, there is a nice play of words, um, because today we're going to talk about learning resilience, uh, and that is in the sense of learning how to be resilient during the pandemic and meeting challenges, and also in the sense of resilience in education and learning despite the pandemic. In this session, we will explore a range of different uh, case studies, such as Japan's K-12 education, technical assistance in the Asia Pacific region, and fostering diversity and gender empowerment in Southeast Asia. Our first speaker I'd love to introduce to you is Dr. Masaki Umejima from Keio University. I would like Dr. Masaki to please introduce yourself and then tell us about distance learning over an open network policy for K-12 education in Japan. Masaki, please. Yep. Thank you for and inviting me to this precious opportunity. I'm Masaki Mejima, an associate professor in K University and ICT promotion and thinking advisor in Ministry of Education in Japanese government. So today's my presentation title is and uh, distance learning for K-12 education in Japan, the Nagasaki Takaoka model. The Nagasaki is the name of the city and Takaoka is the name of the city. So I think please remember the two cities name. So what is the Nagasaki Takaoka model? So every classroom can connect with all nationwide and worldwide classrooms having the internet access. And Cybersecurity is very important issue. So apply data security based on end-to-end -end encryption. So every school is connected to the internet. Speed is very high. Plus, and school can get the thing, free access to cloud service like Zoom and so on. So the system is very simple. So, Satisfaction from student and teacher to the Nagasaki and Takaoka model. The Nagasaki Takaoka model targeted the quality of distance learning lessons at about 60% of that of face to face lessons. This is a very important policy. The distance learning cannot overwhelm the quality of face to face class. So the Nagasaki Takaoka model has targeted about 60% of the satisfaction to the face-to-face -face lesson. So this is, I think, the research finger. So anyway, students showed very good satisfaction, almost 90% plus student satisfied distance learning. How about teacher? Teacher showed, 72% teacher showed good satisfaction to distance learning. 
So learning, four factors drive innovation in daily school education. First, high-speed internet. Second, one tablet in a classroom. Third, teachers delivering distance education. And fourth, the education content enabling free access for students. So these four factors can drive innovation in daily school education. So why I say the speed of the internet is very important? Because origin of the Nagasaki Takaoka model is School on the Internet Asia project. SOI Asia project has provided the ideal environment in which the universities in Asia have managed and utilized the high-speed internet for research and education purposes since 1996. So SOI Asia has almost 20 years history of running the internet operation. So high-speed internet provided a lot of opportunities in terms of research and in terms of education. So let me share one photo in Japanese public school. Now every student have a pub tablet for taking a note. Student can share the note with teacher. This is very interesting. After singing a song, a student put the data on a note and share it with the teacher. Not only with uh, one teacher, student can share digital note with many teachers surrounding a school, not only in, in a school, and then student can exchange note with the teacher in Obashi. This is a very interesting model. So pandemic happened. So we provided two things to student. First, we gave one tablet to student. After that, we provided the high-speed internet access for a student in a home. So every student joined a lecture remotely by a tablet, and that tablet had the internet access in the home. So I add two pillars on existing four, four factors, affordable internet access service in a home and one tablet for every student. So these three factors enable education continuity in the emergency situation, in the critical situation, such as COVID-19. So the university and the government must collaborate to each to implement the education continuity. So that is learning, I think, from Japan case. And user information, please access, I think, a uh, book. So I think this book provides free access. So thank you for, I think, giving me precious opportunity to present Japan case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Masaki, and very interesting case when I came across it. Uh, I thought it was such an interesting case study um, that should be showcased at the IGF. Um, just having the idea of, you know, providing network access, particularly to areas where um, rural areas and, and places where there is not easy access and, and providing students, especially an opportunity to learn. Um, and the interesting thing is that this has happened even before the pandemic is already this project has gone on for many years mm -hmm. uh and and now during the pandemic we see that it's such a valuable thing so thank you very much masaki for sharing yep. um and we will get back to you with q a uh in a little while but mm -hmm. before that let me get to my next speaker so i would like to invite 
um, Tashi Funcho from APNIC to share his experiences providing training and technical assistance to the internet community in the Asia Pacific region. Tashi, tell us about yourself. Thanks, Joyce. Um, can you see my slides? Hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, good morning. I'll borrow what Joyce said earlier. Good morning, good afternoon, evening, whichever time zone you are in. Um, I'm Tashi Funso. I'm one of the trainers here, network analyst, and currently managing the training delivery and technical assistance team. Um, my email address is there. Anyways, this is for us to share our lessons learned um, in, the, in the period of COVID last two years. Um, just a snapshot of what APNIC training consists of. APNIC training does a bit more than training. Um, of course, the obvious one is instructor-led training. We also have webinars to try and cater to interesting stuff that people do, which are outside of the training content. Could be anything interesting. People might be breaking things in their network if they would like to share that experience that comes as a webinar. Um, in the last three or four years, we also have APNIC Academy, um, which has evolved from our initial idea of it being a place where we could push all our prerequisites as online courses and virtual labs. Um, and during the COVID period, our academy has evolved to be more than that. So we have self-paced learning. And then we also provide technical assistance to the community, especially our member base, people who need help with any technology deployment. Again, not everything. We don't want to overstep into the consultants areas. So we stick to IPv6, RPKI, DNS, DNSSEC, network redesign. And I added a fifth circle here, the community build. APNIC also focuses a lot on human networking. And our team has been evangelizing human networking for a while. And in our community, we focus on network operators group um, um, in our parts of the world. JNOG, Japan NOG is very popular. PH NOG is very popular. SG NOG is very popular. Um, in the interest of time, during the COVID period, what was the problem with APNIC training, specific to instructor-led training? Um, the problem with our training, unlike other trainings, is we focus on real-world operations-focused training. So um, it's very less theory, very much more focused on us sharing experiences. So we hardly teach, we discuss a lot. I'm an ex-engineer, I share my experience. My colleagues are all engineers, they share their experience. So when your scope of training is that, it becomes really challenging um, with the online delivery. If it was a structured curriculum, probably it might work for us, but because of just the scope of the training we deliver, um, we have had challenges. Um, hence why we used to deliver this predominantly in a face-to-face um, set up and it's generally targeted. Targeted meaning either we do a needs assessment and try and deliver a training based on the need of a particular economy in our region, or it could be a network operators group or a NOG or a university or a conference that's happening in the economy that wants us to deliver a certain topic. Hence why it's very targeted. It, it's generally done face to face. During the COVID, after April caught in Melbourne, I guess, Fe February, 2020, so we took about two months just to understand how to move our things to our online setup. So it was only in April that we were really ready to actually give it a go. Um, we had lots of issues adapting our content, adapting our session plans, just the way we normally would teach. We are not trainers by profession. We are all engineers. Um, so, so just moving from a face-to-face -face setup to online was quite challenging for us. Adapting our lab environments was very challenging. Um, and what we quickly noticed was there was this dead silence in the online setup. You're teaching a group of engineers who really doesn't seem like they want to be there for that session. Um, so that silence, not knowing how to read people's um, expressions. Um, attendance was a major problem. While we had two, 300 people registering for an event, we would end up with two or three people showing up on the actual day of the session. Um, that was a major problem. Um, positives, yes, um, we could reach more people for sure. We could also do more just because we didn't have to travel. We were delivering from here, but we were also very conscious as what kind of impact were we actually having for engineers? What are the takeaways from online session compared to a face-to-face -face session? 
So some of the uh, quick or low hanging fruits that we tried to tackle first, we said, all right, let's focus on the delivery tools and techniques. We went with touch screens. We have a nice media room now in APNIC office with all touch screen all over multiple cameras so that we can annotate, we can use digital whiteboards. Because again, like I said, our crowd is predominantly 90% of our participants are engineers. So for them, just me sitting there and reading a slide never seems to work. So whiteboarding, just, just explaining how I broke things, for example, um, so that they understand not to do it or not to make the same mistakes I made. So we did that. We also realized in our parts of the world, that's why I like to see that in Japan, internet is not an issue um, during, uh, during uh, Masaki-san's talk. Um, but in our parts of the world, um, in this region, not every economy is equal. Um, there are ma many economies that where participants can barely afford good internet connectivity. So we found out that we will request participants to turn off their videos. We also found out that nobody wants to look stupid in front of their peers. So people would hold back questions, um, which they would normally ask in a face-to-face -face teaching during coffee breaks or, or, or during break times they can access um, without others knowing. So we came up with this concept of, all right, we'll let you ask anonymous questions. Here is an open document, type whatever you want. Um, don't have to raise your hand, don't have to verbalize your questions, type it there, one of us will answer. Um, we threw in quizzes lately. We also then went with a problem-based learning approach where we have now incorporated capture the flag kind of um, problem-based learning in our teachings. Um, for lab, because our teaching is a very lab heavy uh, APNIC training, so we needed a different approach because Zoom chat, like Joyce said earlier, it's very difficult to monitor the Zoom chat when people are trying to interact with each other and it just goes away, it scrolls away. And if someone was tagging you, you miss that. So we, came, we started using Discord for our lab interactions and we realized we need at least two trainers to teach, one to teach, one to monitor the questions and answer those questions. Session plans, we soon realized we can't adapt or adopt our face-to-face -face teachings into online setup. So we went with shorter tutorials, meaning short on theory, more time on labs. We also have to cater to a massive time zone um, in the Asia Pacific region. So we had to repeat the same topic in three or four different time zones so that everybody got a chance to sit through those. And delivery mode, this is where I would like to spend a bit of time. We soon realized that, yes, we were hosting open tutorials, but the attendance was so bad. So we tried also interactions because they had a say in what content they want instead of us trying to guess what content might be suitable for people. Um, then we also had this trial of we were trying to deliver to people's decks for a while. Um, attendance was bad. Interactions were bad. So we again trialed some hybrid approach where participants would be sitting in a common room, COVID restrictions permitting, and we would deliver them remotely from here. That worked really well too. And you can see that in this year's numbers. This year we delivered about 94 trainings um, across the Asia Pacific region. Um, and you can see majority of them were targeted hybrid trainings. And we had only about 40, uh, about 40 percent of those were um, open tutorials. And you can see here is a proof. Um, attendance in targeted or hybrid events were much better compared to open tutorials where we would get four or five people. We now end up with 30 to 40 nice numbers. Now, how did COVID affect our other service, which is technical assistance? Massive effect, um, because technical assistance generally is done really better when you are in person, observing someone's network, auditing their network, understanding their problems. But we received about 18 requests this year. We were able to only cater to about 30% of them. Yes, we acted on all the requests that came in, but from a success point of view, success meaning, yes, we helped with the deployment. How much of an impact did it have in that economy? We I think only managed about 30% of the 18 requests that came in, which is a shame, honestly. And finally, the most important part for me, being an engineer and having learned everything I learned through human networking, um, without having a formal certification or anything, learning from peers like Philip Smith and others, um, mentors, we believe heavily in networking, human networking. Just to give a comparison, between 2018 and 19, we actually managed to start Mongolia now. We managed to st help start Papua New Guinea NOG. We managed to revive Myanmar NOG. 
Cambodia not. But in the last two years, we could not get any knock out of the ground um, just because how do you preach human networking? How do you convince competitors to work with each other when you are not there as a middle neutral person to facilitate that? So that has really been a massive struggle for us. Thank you, Joyce. Sorry if I overran. Thanks very much, Tashi. And oh, don't worry, we're good on time. Um, really sorry to hear it has been a challenging year, um, especially needing to transition from what used to be face to face training and then having to do a lot, a lot of online, you know, remote learning and, and having to try and change and adjust the way training is done, particularly when you have so many components of the training that are hands on. You need, you know, the, the network engineers to really get into the system and follow you step by step. It hasn't been easy. And we will hear more about that um, as well, I think, in, during the Q&A. So next, our final speaker uh, is Mia Perez from the APNIC Foundation. She coordinates the Switch C Gender Project in the Philippines. Mia, please introduce yourself and share about this very interesting project with us. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Just give me a second to bring up your slides, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so I'll be introducing myself. I am Mia Perez from um, the Switch C project. I'm one of the national coordinators. Uh, so today I'll be discussing what Switch C is, the goals of the project, um, our activities, and then some lessons learned. Um, next slide. Um, so Switch C is supporting women IT research leaders in Southeast Asia. We started May of 2020, as you may have noticed. Uh, we are we started at the height of the pandemic, um, and we will end at April 2022 next year. Um, this is a project of the APNIC Foundation, funded by the Cyber Cooperation Program, Department of Foreign Affairs, Australia. So we are a multi-economy project. We have participants in Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, and where I am right now, I'm in the Philippines. Uh, so the goal of the project is to improve the knowledge, skills, and confidence of women and LGBTQI plus technical staff working in the internet industry. Uh, we plan to do that um, by online training, mentoring, and research support. Next. So the difference of the Switch C project with other capacity building activities is we focus more on empowering every participant by first giving them the opportunity uh, to consciously reflect um, where they are right now, what are they doing, what are their activities, um, and then what are their strengths and weaknesses, and what are the personal goals they would like to focus on. Next is ownership. Um, uh, we are giving them the opportunity to um, own their learning, how they're going to do their capacity building activities, and when are they going to start. Um, next. So from the training plan or training plan development and community consultation, here are our results. Uh, we invited 1,600 um, participants. We got around 511 responses. Here are the um, demographics of our participants. Please note that they, they came from around 52 organizations. They selected around 300 plus training courses, and um, they are from 46 providers, uh, one of which is APNIC Academy. So we know that APNIC is not everything for everyone. There are courses not offered in APNIC, and if the participants would like to take courses in another provider, we are supporting that in this project. Um, next. So the selected courses that the participants um, selected, here are the topics or the knowledge areas identified, um, security, network operations, internet routing. They also selected some from the soft skills, but not so soft skills, the management, um, English, and public speaking, and also disaster management. Um, next. So aside from enrolling them in um, courses, we also supported, um, we also have mentoring support. We enrolled them in um, a platform, anitavi.org, where they get to be matched with a mentor somewhere um, in another part of the globe. We also have group mentoring about leadership and professional development. And next, um, we also have 
by request if they are they have um, technical topics that they would like to focus on we also invite technical experts next um, we also fund their researches if they have concrete network operations research that needed funding um, next and also one of the unique um, unique um, activity of uh, switch c is the asia engagement where we um, kind of know or sort of know the environment in which the participants are in to identify the challenges and opportunities for a more inclusive workforce in the internet industry. So we engage the HR to know their staff policies and other professional development support that they are um, doing in the company. Next. So here are the progress. Um, we are now um, funding six researches and then engage with human resources. And for the courses, it increased from 315, they added more courses, like 300 to 348 courses. And so far from April to November, 78% has started their um, journey or their courses and 55% of which are already completed. Um, next. So now for the lessons learned, um, the lessons learned I will be um, sharing first stage of the project. First is the project planning. So um, initial sort of activities of the project are geared for a face-to-face -face and in-country activities. So the project planning, we had to um, concentrate still in the goals, but had to um, transition to a face-to-face -face, um, all online approach in order to reach uh, those goals. Next, in the preparation and community consultation stage, um, we learned the importance of leveraging existing networks, network operators group, um, con um, contacts and directory to um, reach participants, to be in contact with the participants, and even in getting us, the national coordinators. In the selection process, um, I think this is an advantage where the in the confirmation of participants, when all the applications came in, the geographical uh, location of the participants did not limit us from confirming them as long as they have the internet connectivity. Next. Um, for the participation of the participants, um, the course providers that they selected, we learned that they are also experiencing challenges in shifting online. So. Um, the, per, the course providers that we were able to get are only those that have already um, successfully shifted to online offerings. And uh, we also learned that there are challenges with our um, participants, especially in courses only offered in English. And then some of the challenges encountered by our participants, um, they, some of them experience COVID, some have connectivity, and power outages problem. So we are having um, mentoring sessions, but then they will be disconnected um, because of uh, these challenges. Work, life, and professional development balance. Um, some are stressed. Um, Zoom and online fatigue are also there as part of the challenges. And we also learned that a lot of them, actually most of them, chose self-paced courses. And then, um, part of what we are collecting is visibility and advocacy activities. So here we collect um, their activities, like when they share, they apply their knowledge, they attend to conference. And we see that um, aside from taking in knowledge, it's equally important for us to collect and see how are they being visible and being active. Wait, may it be in the um, company internationally or a local setting that they are, um, it's equally important to know if they are being um, visible. Um, next, um, I think this is the my last slide. Um, for the um, some of the lessons learned, also the importance of community support. We learned that here that um, we asked for the company to sign also our agreement for them to know that the participants are embarking in this journey. Uh, we learned the importance of their support the mentor support and other participant support for these um, participants to continue. We also developed um, a community portal for us to 
um, interact and socialize. Um, monthly check-ins to know the, how the participants are doing are also effective. And empathic communication, the only way we can connect with the participants are through Zoom or through email. So it's very important for us to be sensitive um, in what they are encountering or um, in, in, in how we communicate with them. And lastly, um, we um, invited them in a welcome gathering and gave them gifts. And some of the feedback said that um, th these gifts um, made them realize that they are part of something, that, they, that the Switch C project is really existing, though it's only in the virtual world. So um, these are good feedbacks. And yeah, so welcome gathering and gifts. So next slide. Um, so those are the activities of Switch C and some lessons learned. So hopefully we can um, discuss more in the Q&A later. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Thanks very much, Mia. That was great. Sorry, just turning off the presentation. All right. So we did have some questions, which I will read out. And, and I know that um, the, the questions have been answered on the chat, but just for the purpose of um, the recording and also for people who are in the physical room, um, let's have those answers out, uh, uh, voiced out as well. That would help. So the first question was for Masaki. Uh, who invent, uh, invested to buy the tablet for every student in, in your training model? And that is a leadership by the central government. And this was for the duration of the entire training, or it was like a one-off uh, that they gave the tablets it's year after year? I think that so that is a one-off. So I mean, I think mm. that, that this is the first challenge in Japan. Yeah. So I think that this, so I, maybe I think five years later, maybe that I think the government must provide the new machine to student because I think machine is aging, right? Exactly. And so that is also the hardware cost involved. Very interesting. Um, we had another question for Tashi, which is, do you plan to provide online or remote training courses in local languages? As you may know, English is a really challenge for your target audience in some of the local community. Um, yeah, let me compliment what I've typed there. Um, first off, I think our online APNIC Academy, we have support for now close to about eight to 10 languages in the region. So most of the online contents are multilingual contents. But for uh, instructor-led training, like I've alluded to in the chat, APNIC also runs this voluntary community trainers program where we request operational engineers who are active in the community to share their experience, their knowledge. And when we map an event, we also request them if they can help us. Example, if I'm teaching in Mongolia, if we are teaching from Mongolia, we request some Mongolian engineers to help us out and where there is need for translations, be it during the Q&A sessions or a difficult, relatively difficult concept that needs further explaining, we rely on our community trainers to help us out. And where we don't have community trainers, because we currently don't, ideally we would like one per economy, that would be 56 of them, but just because of the scale, we don't have that much, but where we don't have those, we then rely on local partners like NOGS or local hosts to, to give us some local champions who are willing to help us. So that's how we try to manage. Thanks very much for answering the question, Tashi. Um, I don't see any questions or comments at the moment from the chat. I don't know if there are any in the room. Uh, Jennifer will help us with that. But in the meantime, let me pose a question uh, to all of you. Um, what do you think are the long-term effects of the changes that you encounter to your work or to your project? Uh, or, or what do you think are the long-term effects of the outcomes of your work? Maybe Mia, you want to go first? Sure. Um, so I think if we continue to um, adopt an online delivery, um, there's a possibility to expand the project in number also with the participants from different locations, as long as they have internet connection. And for, for the challenges to address the challenge of not having human, um, sort of not having so much of a human connection, 
um, maybe we can explore ways into how we can be better address those issues and challenges. So just a follow up question to Mia, do you think then that for for your project, um, it will ever go back to face to face, you know, when people are able to travel and, you know, they can meet up or do you think it's going to continue as an online sort of project? Um, based on what I know, there are really plans of extending the project and most of the ideation or the proposals are really for an online, still an online approach until we sort of have a clear <laughs> um, COVID cases for each of the country, but we, we would love to be with the participants. Yeah. Thanks very much. How about Masaki Otashi? Yes, and uh, from me, and then I think the the, the everyone I think the who who drive I think distance learning understand the connectivity is the most important parameter. So the quality of the internet, the speed is very important. On the other hand, I learned I think in my study, you know, and Japan is a rich country I think, but five percent of junior high school students. And I think elementary school students could not have the internet access in a home. That was surprising me. So I think we must think about affordability of the internet access seriously, I think. That is learning from my case. Thank you. Thank you, Masaki. And, and I have to say, I myself am very surprised. And I saw Taji also, his eyes was very wide open when you said 5% still <laughs> don't have access. I, I mean, I guess it is a, a myth or a misconception that a very developed economy like Japan will also have a, yes. a population that doesn't have access yet. So it's, it's a very, um, very chilling, but I think a lot of work needs to be done, yeah. I think, in this area. I think that I think that is real in Japan and that is real in US and then Korea or something else. So I mean we must think about I think the affordability of the internet access. That is I think important parameter, I think. Mm. Tashi, what do you think? Yeah, I would like to echo Masaki-san here, but yeah, that would definitely was a surprise, Masaki-san, but yeah. um, we assume that Japan being a developed economy yes, and all, yeah. um, but you're absolutely right. And what we are trying to do, because of similar challenges in our part of the world, where sometimes we have seen half the class disappear and turns out their data cap, most of them seem to have data capped broadband connection. Yeah. The class disappeared and we were like, what did we yes. do? And they would then come back about 30 minutes later, they had gone recharged their broadband mm -hmm. connection or mobile connections. Mm -hmm. So in example, Bhutan, my, I'm originally from Bhutan um, and I have quite a, I have quite a connection there, good friends there. So I have been trying to leverage and convince our Drukren, the Bhutanese Research and Education Network, if they would like to extend the Drukren connectivity to just not just universities, colleges, but extend it to every high school, every primary school, every community sure. school. And we're in the Himalayas. Um, it's very remote, mountainous. Yeah. So they are working on that. And it's really good to see that they have bought about 240 routers just to connect all the tiny community schools in the mountains. So definitely, I think. But back to Joyce's original question of how does it impact our work in the long run? I'll be very honest, just because of the nature of what we teach or how we teach things. Um, again, the fact that we are teaching engineers, I think it's very, very difficult. I think if you are a new engineer or a final year student or a relatively mid-level engineer, I think we can help with our online courses, with our self-paced learning courses on academy. But if you are a mid-level engineer or a senior engineer, who would like to discuss deployment issues with us. I think the online setup is definitely not working for us. And we saw that just about two weeks ago, we were in Perth, Joyce knows. Um, that was the first trip this year. We are the most traveled people in APNIC for this year. <laughs> we did one trip to Perth and it was amazing. It's only 16 engineers in the class, 
but it was amazing being able to read people's expression. We hardly taught, we discussed the whole day. And we found out two very critical issues, one with the RPKA framework itself and one with how APNIX portal works, which we wouldn't have found in an online setup. We found it only because people were willing to have those corridor chats with us, coffee break chats with us. So yeah, Joyce, I'm not too sure how to balance this out, honestly. Thanks, Tashi, for being honest uh, about the challenges that you face and trying to overcome them. And, and maybe sometimes the solution is not trying to overcome everything. You, you want to try and balance and see if you can go back to a kind of maybe not online only, but a hybrid form of learning. Um, one more question I have would be, having said all this, how, how do you think um, inclusion has been affected? With all this online learning, with, with having to engage people online, do you think people do you think we're more inclusive now because of, of being connected online? Or, or do you think actually, you know, inclusion has been impeded in some way? Who would like to go first? <laughs> Nobody wants to try going first. And let me try, Joyce, then okay. Sure. Um, yeah. um Inclusion, I think theoretically, the most obvious one seems to be, oh, we should be able to reach now those that were not reachable those days, those who can't. So I think there's a validity there because not everyone can afford to fly to a common location um, where there's a conference happening, be it apricot conference, be it NOGS. So for those people, and especially in our parts of the world, again, um, in some smaller companies, you are the one man or one woman who everything relies on. If you go away on leave, the whole company collapses or network collapses. So for those people, they have we see those faces that we would hardly see in conferences now showing up for our online sessions. And, and, and I totally value that. But on the other side, um, what we are also seeing the, is this repeat group of people rocking up at every online session we do, whether we do it for uh, UTC plus 13 time zone, we see someone from UTC plus four rocking up there for that session, just because they were free after work or it was early before they went to work because they their bosses wouldn't let them. Because during online, I think when you're listening to someone's training and your colleagues drag you away or your boss drags you away, so many people prefer doing it either in the evenings or during weekends. We have even had requests to host trainings on weekend. Um, so Joyce, I think I see value in both. I think like you said earlier, I think we, even after we go back to normal, whenever that is, I think we definitely need to balance out. We need to cater to, yes, from an interaction point of view, face-to-face -face, in-person seem to work great. But like I said, what about those that don't get a chance? Do we, that left out, um, do we cater to them? So I think Joyce, like you said, we need to continue doing online or hybrid approaches while still trying to do those in-person for specific topics that we might need to do. But I think we would continue wanting to do online stuffs also. Yeah, Joyce. Thanks, Tashi. How about Mia? I think you alluded to some of this, talking about you know diversity and inclusion in your presentation. Maybe you want to elaborate a bit, elaborate more on it. Um, I agree with Tashi about the um about being able to participate more, um, given that you're online setting. And I also agree that maybe we are leaving some out those also that do not have that connection. Um, maybe I, what I can add to that is, um, especially because we are a project that is targeting um, gender inclusivity, um, for this project, if we're concentrating to projects um, with um, more inclusive in gender, we hope that um, this project and the, maybe the next iterations would increase women participation um, by having more women with certifications and pushing for more active, to be more active in the community, work or industry. Um, we also hope that this kind of project would increase inclusion um, in diversity and in gender. Thanks Mia, that's such a great answer. Masaki, what are your thoughts? Yeah, Joyce, I think that 
your question is very good, but difficult to answer. <laughs> yeah, but I think that from my experience, I think that I can say one thing. And then I think that, of course, I think that if I show the face-to-face -face lesson and I think the distance learning to the student, student will choose and face-to-face -face because I think my case target, I think junior high school and elementary school student. But I think that I want to share one interesting experience. Now I think students share their digital note with teacher. So when students receive the answer from, from teacher overseas, students, I think they get, got very enthusiastic to it. Oh my God. And then I think teacher in Philippines comment on my note, great, that kind of things. So I think and the distance learning will bring, I think that maybe another opportunity, for example, telling diversity of the, I think people to the student, that kind of thing. So I think that I can create and I think the new I think, opportunity for student, I think. Thanks very much, Masaki. What I'm hearing from all of you is, in general, yes, it sounds like, you know, in inclusion and diversity will increase, you know, just by design. Uh, being online means many different people from other different parts of the region or the world are able to dial in, tune in. I mean, the IGF, uh, as it is now in the hybrid format, is, is a case example. Um, if you couldn't fly to Katowice in, in Poland, at least now we have the option of being able to run the session online and still be able to participate anyway. So from, from that view, it does sound like inclusion will in increase. But then at the same time, I think we do compromise a bit on having that face-to-face -face interaction, which is, which is something quite different uh, when we engage people um, and we're able to do it in person. And so our friends who are now sitting in the room in Katowice, I'm, I'm sure you also have this um, feeling about you know, how it is like to be there in the room, um, having to listen to us. Um, and of course, um, if you have any questions, uh, whether you can put it in the chat or you can say it on the mic, you know, feel free to do so. We also want to make sure that you feel included. Uh, it is not just an online only session. <laughs> so, I don't see any other comments or questions at the moment either. So I'll get on to maybe asking one last question, which is, what do you think are some lessons that we can learn uh, from these educational models, whether it's about the delivery, whether it's about the interaction? Um, Mia, do you want to go first? I know in your presentation, like the last few slides, you, you did put some, some notes there about the lessons learned. So what do you, would you prioritize as like the top one or two important lessons that you've taken away? Um, for the educational models, I think um, the opportunity to own one's learning journey um, is crucial to achieving one's personal development goals. So that's one. And also another component of the project um, that, that I discussed, I think engaging the HR in the conversation gives us a more holistic view of the capacity building efforts that we need, uh, we need to give to the participants or to a person. And it's also good to know if those capacity building activities are aligned to the organization or are there other approaches we can explore. Um, so those things, um, I think, are um, good learning opportunities. Thanks, Mia. Um, next, how about Tashi? Would you like to try going next? Yeah, Joy. Um, thanks again. Um, lessons or takeaways from the last 18 or 19 months. Um, quite difficult to put it there, but I think what we are learning honestly is we would definitely want to continue with our remote online deliveries, maybe up to an intermediate level so that we can free up the in-person face-to-face interactions for more real hands-on deployment specific kind of discussions so that way it would also allow us to scale because we have to cater to 56 economies in this region so 
online allows us. We can't fly to every um, event globally. Example, I don't think I would be at this IGF event if this was happening um, in person, honestly, um, just because of the nature of the work in the office. <laughs> um, um, so at least um, continue with that, but I think um, not forget the fact that um, in person or face to face allows helps us definitely with technology deployments or technology uh, or, or, or validation of people's deployments. So yeah, Joyce, I think we would want the lesson for us is we would like to continue with both, um, but to cater to different scopes of what we do. Yeah. Thanks, Tashi and Masaki. Yep, and uh, just and then I think the my learning and then and the handout maybe. And then the, we should not compare face-to-face -face and the remote, I think, learning. And then I think, of course, and then face-to-face -face has a good thing. But on the other hand, uh, remote learning has a good thing. So I think, and the, but I think when we implement the remote learning, the internet connectivity is very important. Plus affordability to the internet access is another important. So that two factor will be, I think, the highlighted when we address the I think, distance learning environment to be more ideal, I think. Thank you, Masaki. And, and finally, I would like to pose the question, the same question. Uh, so what lessons can we learn you know, from these educational models or what lessons have you learned from your own personal experiences to the audience? So whether online or, or for the people who are in the room, um, if you would like to share your experiences in this area and your thoughts around it, we would love to hear from you. So I, I will wait a few seconds to see if anybody, any brave soul would like to take the mic. Chris. Hello. Um, yeah, my name is Chris Buckridge. I'm working for Ripe NCC, so one of the other RIRs. Uh, what I really wanted to do is just um, commend the, the final messages that we heard there from each of the three speakers, because I think it really echoes strongly with what APNIC, uh, sorry, Ripe NCC <laughs> has heard um, and, and has sort of <laughs> felt about um, our, our educational activities in, in this period. I, what we've done, I, I'm, like the other RIRs, certainly like APNIC, is really obviously fallen back to a, a remote model. Um, and it's meant that that model, that remote teaching that we've done has really evolved significantly in the last two years. Um, and, and I think that's that's been really important. And I think it particularly, I mean, we, we also have a very broad and diverse service region. And there were always parts of that service region that were getting remote um, education, like that we couldn't always send people in, in person. I think this this really helps those parts, uh, more remote parts of the world, because it has leveled up the kind of remote teaching capacity that all of us have. And that's a really important thing. Um, I think to Mia's point about sort of owning the, the education journey or uh, goals, um, I think that's, that's also something we've, I think, come to understand better in this period. And it's sort of informed the way we've developed the courses. And we're now doing this new certified professionals program, which is very much about that, it's giving people more sort of digital certification of their, their education and the courses that they've done and ways to understand that. Um, and, and then finally, yeah, the point about we absolutely can't compare apples and oranges in terms of remote and face-to-face. -face. They're going to be different. It's not going to be a situation where remote can replace face-to-face -face or capture everything, but it does offer opportunities for so much more as well. So we're understanding the sort of the importance of maintaining both and developing both. So yeah, I just really enjoyed the session and hearing the experiences. So thanks everyone. Thanks very much, Chris. That's lovely to hear. And thank you for sharing your thoughts and your experiences as well. I think we have someone from Katowice who would like to speak. Please introduce yourself. Hi, Joyce. This is Carol from the Bahamas. Um, I, I think with the online training, it, well, I work for the government of the Bahamas in the IT department. And the pandemic has allowed executives to be more open to paying for subscriptions for training programs. So it has been um, very useful to us because now we have 
Whereas we struggle to get one subscription. We now have two subscriptions for our um, employees to use. But it is a struggle trying to get um, persons to give up their time, I suppose, to, to complete courses because they're having to, as one of the um, presenters said, they're having to do work as well as training. So whereas if you had it on a face-to-face, -face, the person was actually removed from their um, env work environment and they went off to, to do a class. So there was no interruptions. So there are, there, there's good and bad in um, issues, advantages and disadvantages in both means of, of training. So that's just my input. Thank you so much. I believe it was Carol for uh, for sharing your thoughts about this, and and I do agree. I think a, a lot of people uh, have been using the term, you know, Zoom fatigue or w whichever platform that you're using, whether it's Microsoft Teams or some proprietary platform, um, and just the idea that we have so many online meetings is one thing, uh, but the fact that you cannot physically you know, just devote that time to this one thing happening. So for example, if, if this IGF event, we are attending it in person, we would all be fully dedicated to just a conference. You're not multitasking, trying to do other things at the same time while you're delving into the meeting, which I think everybody here has that experience. So I think in this session, I, I, what I'm hearing is a lot of people having a very shared common experience uh, around the impact of the pandemic and having that sort of that sharing of uh, experiences across what we have um, been doing in, in the course of our work. And I think it is the same as well for the users um, that we are in touch with. So I'm very grateful for, for all your time. I don't know if there are any other people who want to make any comments, give any feedback. So I think in the physical room, I don't see anyone at the mic, nor in the chat. So I think we are almost due for closing, just a few minutes left. And what I would like to do is invite my speakers again to just give your final thoughts, maybe one or two lines, um, your key takeaways um, that you hope people will, will be able to take back with them from this session. So Masaki, would you like to go first? Yeah, I think on the remote learning maybe can change, I think, the, our, I think, the education scheme. So I think the anyway, just do it. That is my message. Thank you. That is so succinct <laughs> and very to the point. Thank you, Masaki, and thank you for, for being here with us today, all the yeah. way from Japan. Uh, yeah. Next, how about Mia? Um, so my message, maybe it will be long, <laughs> so um, set our eyes on the goals, may it be increasing inclusivity in gender and connectivity or access, and do necessary adjust adjustments to these new realities. Yes, it is a very challenging time, and yes, we can't do this alone, so if we need to you know, virtually hold hands and collaborate with each other, just like what we're doing in this session. We share and discuss our um, best practices. Hopefully by just persisting and collaborating, we'll be in a better place than we started. So that's my take. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. And finally, Tashi. Well, yeah, Masaki san and me has uh, said it already. For me, I think if we are the ones delivering content, maybe focus on shorter sessions. Um, yeah. That seems to work really well. And not to forget, I think we all keep forgetting the same audience is also being targeted by others, vendor trainings or similar not-for-profit not organizations wanting to cater to those same audience. And no wonder the Zoom fatigue word has become so popular out there because we are all targeting the same audience. So yeah, join thank you thank you very much and, and thank you tashi for joining us even though it's it's oh, 10 minutes to midnight for you uh, and having you stay up for this I, I really thank you and appreciate you as well so i will close the session here with two minutes left to the end and i thank you all for your participation thank you for dialing in and to those of you who joined us despite the main session going on i do appreciate you uh, being here with us uh, and, and I hope that this session was meaningful for you. So thank you very much, everybody. Yep.
Yes, thank you for your great coordination. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank Tashi. You, Joyce. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. So thank see you. you. Goodbye. Jane, thank you. Goodbye. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. <laughs> uh, hello. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.